Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be looking at vector integral calculus. So if you've ever come across symbols such as these ones, these ones over here, or even these ones, this video is just for you if you're curious what those fancy mathematical symbols actually mean. Now, just before we get started, though, the pre prerequisite for this video is my differential in dif uh, vector differential calculus video, uh, which will be explaining what terms such as the gradient means, so the gradient of a function, the divergence of a function, or the curl of a function. So if those terms mean nothing to you at the moment, you need to go back and have a look at my video on the differential vector calculus in which we're going to be explaining these. However, if you're familiar with those, then this will be the video just for you to take you up to the next step to understand vector integral calculus. Now, who is this video actually aimed at? First off, if you're planning to study physics at university, this will give you an incredible head start into looking at some very important mathematics. If you are already at university, uh, typically this material is taught uh, during electromagnetism and it's vital for introducing Maxwell's equations. And then further on, it's used in um, quantum mechanics in combining relativity and electromagnetism, for instance. Um, also in mathematics, it's used uh, loads in differential equations and fluid mechanics, the Navier-Stokes equations, etc. So this is one of the most useful bits of mathematics that, that I can think of. So let's get started. And uh, what we're going to be looking at today are three things. First off, we're going to explain what is a line integral what is Gauss's theorem, and finally, what is Stokes' theorem. And I'm also going to be proving all of these theorems. Okay, well, let's get started with our first point on the agenda, and that is, what is a line integral? Imagine that we have a curve L. This could be of any random shape, any random direction, just a curve between two points, a and B. Imagine we also have a scalar function along here or a scalar uh, field which really depends on X, Y and Z. Then we can define the rate of change of that scalar field as simply as the gradient or grad F which is just a vector. As we've shown in our previous video, the gradient is just d5 by dx, x hat, where x hat just simply indicates that this here is the x component, the uh, f by dy in the y component, and the f by dz in the z component. Now, we can use a line integral if we wanted to find the change so the change in the function f along the curve. So what do I mean by that? Let's say that I want to integrate the change or the rate of change of that function from a to b. I can essentially get a line integral along the curve l of the gradient of the function. And I'm going to take the scalar product with, with another vector which is always along the function. An infinitesimal vector which is always along the function called dl. Just to visualize the, this, I'm going to draw it here. So for instance, this here could be our dl here. This here could be our dl across here. And this one could be the one over here. Now I'm going to integrate this between the two points. Let's say uh, they're going to be points A here and B there. Now the total change in the function will have to be equal to essentially the differences in the values between the two points of the function. So if I'm summing up all the change, I'm just going to have, well, essentially delta F, which is just F at point B, take away F at point 
A. And this is our first little theorem, which will be very, very useful in evaluating the, um, the line integrals along a curve L. There's a mathematical proof to this. I'm not going to prove it in this video, but you can check out Feynman's lectures on physics where Richard Feynman uh, shows a very intuitive and relatively simple proof of this expression. But because this is a very intuitive expression, all we're doing is we're summing the rate of the, or the change in the function along a line L, then this will have to be equal to the total change. So you can kind of think of this as the sum of all the individual infinitesimal changes. So sum of all the individual changes will have to equal the total change in the function. And this is just a dot product, a way of multiplying two vectors. And let's say that uh, grad f, which is, once again, it's uh, just a vector, and dl is also a vector. And the scalar product will just give us a scalar. But let's say that, uh, let's say, I don't know, here, uh, the function f was along here, so that's uh, that's uh, grid, the gradient of f, let's say, is pointing in this direction overall. Then we're just finding the two dot products between this and that, and then we're literally summing all of them. So at any point, let's say that here, the function was was pointing this way and dl is pointing this way. Let's say here, grad f is pointing this way, dl is pointing that way, etc. What you're really doing is you just summing all the contributions of gradient of f along this curve. And that leads us to, once again, the formula that the gradient of f dot dl is equal to f of b take away f of a, which is the total change. And now let's move to Gauss theorem, which is also known as the divergence theorem. You can see that it involves a surface integral and then a volume integral, but I'm going to be explaining exactly what those mean. In order to really understand the divergence theorem, first off, we must really understand what flux actually is. Now, what is flux? Imagine that you have any surface, I've chosen this two-dimensional green surface, the color is very important, and um, let's imagine that I have some function h, uh, which just represents the heat flow out of this um, out of the surface. In reality, it could be something else. For instance, it could be the, I don't know, the electric field, uh, some sort of a velocity field, or, you know, any vector function, really. So there's loads of these vectors around here, let's say h here. Uh, well, let's define them on the surface. So let's say that there's some heat flow kind of there, there, there. It could vary with, with places. Uh, then let's say that there's one here in this region. Now, if I have a region like that, and all of these vectors are just h, let's imagine this is a very, very small region. So let's say that the y dimension, it's going to be dy tall, and it will be dx wide. So the two-dimensional integral with respect to the area will be written as dA, which is just dx dy. And this is just a shorthand notation. You can kind of see that in uh, actually in Gauss's theorem up here. So this dA up here, all it means is dx dy. Now dV will be a volume integral, which is just dx dy dz, just like in z physics, but these, this dv here is just like that. Now, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what is the heat flow out of this surface dy dx? Let's call that dA. Well, the heat flow out of dA, so let's just write this down, heat flow out of dA will just be given by the function h times the normal vector 
multiplied by dA. So H dotted with N, where N is the normal vector. So let's just say that this here is the normal N. Now, if you make these infinitesimally small, then you're going to get the heat flow out of that particular tiny region. Now, the total heat flow out of the whole area will be equal to the surface integral, which um, in reality, all that the surface integral is, is the um, double integral of h dot n dA, which is really just h dot n, where we would integrate this first off with respect to x, and then with respect to y. This will be the heat flow out of this whole surface. So this is the low heat flow out of dA, but this here is the heat flow out of the entire surface. This is actually the mathematical meaning of a flux. It is this surface integral. So should we just write this down and we can say that the flux of the function h is defined as the surface integral of h dot n. So you take a function, you dot it with the normal, then you integrate that over the surface. So let's actually prove Gauss's theorem. I've called this Feynman's proof of the divergence theorem because I first came across it in the Feynman lectures on physics. But imagine that we have a little cube over here. And let's say that the cube has a length, uh, let's say delta x in the x direction. So this, this side here is delta x. Let's say that delta y, which is just this side here, that's the height of the cube, delta y. And let's say that z is this dimension here, which comes out of the board. So the um, size of the cubes in the x direction will be delta x, that's just the side, delta y will be essentially the height, and delta z will just be how far along we've come along in this dimension. Now let's uh, place our coordinate system just here. So let's say that this here is the origin. So this means that this point here, rather than 0, 0, 0, let's just give it coordinates x, y, and z. Well, if that's the case, this point here will be just x, y plus delta y, because that's just the size of the cube, z. So that's the coordinate of this point. Uh, let's pick another one. Let's say this one here will be x plus delta x, which is just the size of the cube in the x direction, y, z. And finally, let's just pick this point here, which will just be x, y, z plus delta z. Now, let's find the, um, the flux out of phase 1, first of all. So let's call this phase here 1. Oh, let's switch to the actual pen on the highlighter. So let's say that this phase here is phase 1. And let's say that this phase here is phase 2. Now, remember, when we looked at flux, we defined the flux as uh, h dot n dA. Now, just for a bit of a change, let's choose a different letter for our vector function. So, I don't know, it could be some sort of a force field. We can, we can just call it F, or it could be a velocity field. It doesn't really matter. Some general function um, F. So, let's say that the function F is going this way on phase 2, but it's also going pretty much the same way on phase one. Now, we're going to need the perpendicular component, which is this one here, which is really is just the x component. So I'm going to call that fx. 
Now, because the normal to both of these faces is actually pointing in a different direction, this will actually uh, make the math uh, a little bit different. I'm going to explain how, but the normal to face one is pointing outwards. So the normal, you can kind of imagine that is pointing this way, whereas the normal on face two is pointing the other way. So because of that, the flux through phase one will be negative. Now let's write this down and uh, in, um, in quite a bit of detail, I can just write that the flux, so let's just say flux of F and let's say through phase one will just simply be equal to negative fx dA, which is simply equal to dy by dz. So we can just write this as delta y, delta z. This is just our uh, dA. Okay, well, our flux of f through, let's say, phase two on the other hand will be positive and once again it's positive because our normal vector is pointing in the same direction as the vector field f will be simply equal to fx and then it will be by this area here which is exactly the same it's going to be delta y delta z now there is a problem though this is assuming the function f does not change from one to two and um, what we need to do is we need to account for that. So I'm going to say that in general, the values of fx are, are going to be a little bit different at point one or phase one and phase two. So just to account for that, um, let's just say that we can call it fx, uh, let's say uh, at point one, delta y delta z. I'm going to do the same for the second phase which is fx, let's call it 2, delta y delta z. If the cube is small enough they're going to be uh, very very similar but a little bit different. How different exactly are they going to be? Well, remember, in our study of, um, of line integrals, which we actually said was that fx of, let's say, at point 2, take away fx at another point 1, is just equal to the line integral of the function, um, which is essentially just the rate of change of the function. So let's call it df of x. Uh, by dx, and then we're going to multiply that by the line segment, which in this case is just delta x. Now, because of that, fx uh, 2 will be equal to df, dfx by dx, delta x plus f of x 1. Okay, well, now this is, well, it really is just algebra, but let's take this expression and sub that into this expression for the flux of f through phase two. Now, this is just equal to, so let me just write through flux of f uh, through phase two is just f of x2 delta y delta z. Let me just rewrite that. Uh, f of x2 uh, delta y delta z. But now let's sub this line into here. What we're going to get, let's use some brackets. Uh, df of x by dx delta x plus f of x one, and then close brackets, delta y, delta z. Now let's combine and find the total flux out of phase one and phase two. So let's see, I'm going to do this over here. 
and we'll just maybe make the pen a little bit bigger. Okay, so let's find a flux out of phase one plus phase two. So let me just write that in a little bit better. Phase one plus phase two. Okay, well, we can see that the flux out of phase one is just minus. Uh, fx1 delta y delta z and the flux out of phase 2 is given by the following so plus delta fx by d by dx times delta x plus fx1 and then we have delta y, delta z. We can factorize delta y, delta z out like so. What we're left with is minus fx1 plus fx1 plus dfx by dx. And then um, we are going to have a little delta x here let's not forget that then it's delta y delta z you can see where i'm going with this we can cancel out those two expressions oh have you guys spotted my uh, my my mistake i've already factorized delta y delta z so i don't actually need this term okay well this gives us a combined flux out of phase one and phase two to simply be uh, d f of x by dx, then I have delta x, and then I have a factor of dy and uh, delta y delta z. So this is the flux out of those two faces, out of this one here, and then out of this one there. Now mathematically we can uh, prove in exactly the same way, just changing some indices, that the flux out of faces, let's say, 3 and 4 and 5 and 6, so those two faces and then those two faces uh, will be um, exactly the same but with some change indices, so the flux out of faces 3 and 4 uh, will be df by dy, dy, delta x, delta y, delta z, and the flux out of phases 5 and 6 will be df uh, z by dz, and then delta x, delta y, delta z. I'm not going to prove these separately because otherwise this video will be well over one hour long. But please, when you're going for these, take a moment just to prove this. Okay, well, here's one of my favorite parts. So, so far we have found the flux out of phase 1 and phase 2 over here, out of phase 3 and 4, and out of uh, phase 5 and 6. So if we just sum them up, we're going to find the total flux out of this cube for this function f. Now the total flux is just really just the surface integral. So the surface integral of f dot n dA, which is just the total flux, I can just write this down here, total flux, will be equal to all of these summed up. So what I'm going to write is that this is equal to df x by dx plus dfy by dy plus dfz uh, by dz and then multiplied by delta x delta y and then delta z. 
But hang on a minute, if you remember this quantity dfx by dx plus dfy by dy plus dfz by dz is actually just a dot product of, uh, of f with the, with the gradient vectors and we called this the divergence in our previous video. So what this means is that for this very, very tiny cube, this infinitesimal cube, um, the flux of a function n which is f dot n dA is going to equal the divergence of f because all of this here is actually uh, the, the, the divergence and I can just highlight this just to show you guys that this here is uh, simply the divergence. So that's essentially the same just here. K and times delta x dy uh, delta z. Well, this here is just our infinitesimal volume, uh, which can, we can call delta v or dv. Now, assuming that our cube was initially infinitesimal, we can generalize this for a much bigger cube and we can integrate over the entire volume. And we can get, finally, the result that f dot n dA, which is just really just the um, flux of the vector field f is going to equal to the volume integral of the divergence of f dot dV. And this, my friends, is Gauss's theorem, one of the most beautiful results in, uh, in mathematics with countless applications. Um, by the way, this is not a fully rigorous proof, however, it's very much an intuitive proof, but uh, if you just search for a proof of Gauss's theorem or the Devotion's theorem online, you'll be able to uh, find plenty of materials on this. Now, let's move back to line integrals. First off, we need to define a quantity which is known as the circulation of a vector field. Imagine that we have a loop. So in the previous um, video, what we did is we did a loop between two points, but now we're not stopping at that point, but we're essentially kind of coming back to our original point to form a complete loop. Can we integrate a field along this entire loop? Well, of course we can. All we need to do is um, when you take the line integral of a function, because we're dealing with circulation, let's call the function c dot dl, where dl is just a little vector here at various uh, different points, just an, in, an infinitesimal length vector. And all we need to do is we need to sum them up over the entire loop. Just to remind ourselves that this is a line integral over a complete loop, we include this little circle in the integral sign. So c dot dl is very often written as simply c dl, by the way. So from now on, the two are going to be equivalent. Okay, well, let's assume that the length, the total length of this loop is L and let's do something a little bit different. Let's divide it into a couple of parts. So let's do that over here. Now what we can say is, let's say that the first part of the loop, let's say that's L1. So let's give these guys some names. Let's say that the line from here to here is L. A, B, let's say that here this is L, A, and let's say that this one here is L, B. Now, the path L1 will simply be equal to L, A plus L, A, B, and let's just say that L2, which is just this loop kind of over here, really, um, that's just simply going to be L, B plus L, A, B. Now, here is something that can be a little bit uh, trickier to imagine, but the total circulation, so let's just write that the circulation around L will be equivalent to the circulation 
around L1 plus the circulation around L2. Circulation around L2. Now, what, what, what do I mean by that? In this case, it's almost easier just to showcase with a pen. So let's draw the circulation around uh, around the, the loop L. Uh, it's very important to keep exactly the same direction of movement of the pen when you're doing this, by the way. So let's say across L, the circulation is just going to be this full loop across here okay now the circulation around l1 let me draw this let's say in yellow like so so across l1 is just this loop over here so from here i'm kind of going upwards like that and i'm back at the original place so i was going this way like so okay now let's draw the circulation around uh, lb following the same direction and for that let's use let's say green like so okay so i'm going to be going in the same direction so let's just start kind of over here and notice that i'm going now in the opposite direction so the contributions of L, A, and B are going to be cancelling out. And this is just an intuitive way of just understanding that the circulation around L will be equal to the circulation around L1 plus the circulation around L2. Now we can take this a step further and uh, we can imagine that we can make infinitely many cubes essentially or um, let's say that this is our surface once again we can imagine just dividing this into many different separate loops and all we need to do really is just find the circulation around one of those loops and then integrate to find the total circulation around um, um, for the for the entire surface. So how do we actually find the circulation around just one of those tiny squares? So imagine I've kind of zoomed in into this infinitesimal little square. So I'm going to be keeping the same um, x, y coordinates. So let's say that here is the y axis and down here is the x axis. Um, let's actually center the x and y coordinates in such a way that let's say that this point here just has coordinates y and x. Exactly the same way as our volume case earlier, but a little bit simpler because we're just dealing with two dimensions. Let's say that the height is delta y and let's say that the length is delta x. Now we're essentially ready to start our line integration of, um, of our function C along this path, along this line from here to here. Let's say that this is part one of, um, of our loop. Then from here to there, which is, let's say, part two, part three. So along here, along here, along here, and down here at part four. Okay, well, um, we can say that in this case that the line integral of um, c dot dl will be equal to, we can actually do a little bit of factorization. So we can say that, let's say cx1 take away cx3. Uh, and then let's have some brackets and uh, we can write times delta x and uh, we can have plus uh, open brackets cy2 take away cy4 then close brackets delta y. 
And uh, this here is an expression for the circulation along this path, uh, uh, along this uh, along this path in this infinitesimal square. Now let's focus on just a part of this expression. Normally the the the, func the function will actually vary between the the two points, and just like we did in uh, the uh, the previous case, we can use the rate of change of that function uh, to work out the value of the expression c x one take away c x three. Now our change in that function, let's say delta cx, uh, between the two points between three and one, uh, let's just say that this is equal to just cx three, take away cx one, just final take away initial. Um, well, that will just be equal to the rate of change of cx with respect to y because remember to go from one to three we have to move in the y direction multiply by the distance that it's moved which is delta y exactly like we did for our first line integral of this video well if that's the case well we can uh, essentially take this expression here and substitute that back up there. In order to do so, let's just write this down. Uh, just let's uh, take away the inverse of that. So let's multiply everything by minus one. And we get that cx1 take away cx3 is actually minus dcx by dy delta y. Okay, well, using that, um, let's take this expression uh, here and then just sub this back um, into the um, the expression just above. So we're taking this expression. Let's highlight this really well. We're just substituting that back up here. And what we're going to get is that the line integral of C um, with dot dl is going to equal uh, minus delta cx by dy times dy. Uh, we don't actually even need the bracket there, but let's just include it times delta x. Uh, like so this already starting starting to remind me of the curl and uh, very very similarly we can do exactly the same mathematics for um, this portion of the function here and we're going to find that this will be equal to uh, delta or dcy by dx times uh, delta y delta x um, the proof for that this section here, so let me just uh, leave that here. So the proof that of uh, that this is equal to this, I'm going to leave uh, for you guys, and it's in exactly the same way as I've just shown you across here. Well, what we can do is we can do a little bit of uh, just algebra simplification really and what we're going to find is that delta cy by dx take away delta cx by dy um, multiply by delta y delta x is equal to the loop integral of c dot dl well, hang on a minute. This is actually the z component of the curl of a vector. Remember, the curl of the vector c is simply uh, this expression. I know it's fairly, it's looking like it's complicated, but essentially this here is the x component. This here is the y component. And the important one for us at the moment is, I'm just going to highlight here this one here is the z component now just for a change we've just used i had j hat and k hat for uh, for the three vectors but it doesn't almost um, matter which uh, notation you use for vectors but the important thing to note is that the z component um, 
of the curl of the vector field C is dCy by dx take away dCx by dy. So oh, let's write that properly. So this here is dy. Well, this is exactly what we have on this side here. So we can just simply say that the loop integral of C uh, dot dl for this infinitesimal uh, curve is actually just the z component of the curl of C. So curl of C, let's uh, say, let's write down like this, that this will be the z component. Uh, multiplied by the infinitesimal area. We could write it as dA or we can just stick to dx, dy in this case. Now here is something um, pretty incredible. Well, the z component of the curl really is just a perpendicular component. All the x, y, and z components are perpendicular anyways. So we can essentially equate this with a surface integral. So we can say that the uh, surface integral C dot DL will be equal to the normal component of the curl of that vector function. Um, so we can say we've essentially dotted it with the normal, then we've multiplied it by del delta X delta Y. Uh, let's just write this as delta a. And this is for an infinitesimal square. Remember, all that we've done so far essentially be just a zoomed in mathematical version of one of those tiny infinitesimal squares. Of course, we can, uh, we can generalize this as well. And we can say that for a full loop across the entire loop L, we can say that the uh, C um, dot uh, dot DL where it's around the entire loop L will be equal to essentially the surface integral of the curl dot d a and this here is um, essentially stokes theorem so this is known as stokes uh, stokes theorem uh, which really is just a two-dimensional special case of green's theorem uh, which can be used uh, for any dimensions and uh, this is a very very important um, result that we're going to use a lot in our study of Maxwell's equations. Okay, folks, well, we've covered so much mathematics in this video. Uh, hopefully this is useful. Very well done if you've managed to follow everything. Remember, this is just the start of your journey to understand theoretical physics really, really well. Well done for watching. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next video.